ready for Smoke Night Live with Master Sensei. All right, here we are, ladies and gentlemen. First off, if you're watching on Facebook right now, if you're watching on Facebook right now, let me know if you can hear me because for some reason, Facebook has been going nuts for the last three weeks. So it turns out that um, because of this quarantine, everybody on in the world, Emmett, I'm sitting here with Emmett, blindmenspuff.com. Hello. How are you doing, Emmett? Super. Everybody in the world is, um, you know, they're FaceTiming each other. They are zooming one another. They're hang, you know, they're doing all these things, which is causing a mass glut in bandwidth. Just and demolishing the so bandwidth. So every week has, for the last four weeks, has been a bit of an adventure. Um, we've had the same exact settings, and sometimes they work, sometimes they don't work. So uh, all we can do, folks, and I apologize, uh, is the best we can do, Emmett, is just. You know, fight through this. Go with what we got. We got to go with what we've got. Uh, this is going to be an amazing show. I've been looking forward to this show for a long time. I got this book in the mail today from the folks at JC. Now, you'd have to, Emmett, you'd have to be under a rock somewhere if you didn't know the anything at all about the JC Newman. Just a legendary family. Yeah, a legendary family. But I got this book um, today, and it's written by Stanford J. Newman. So uh, this is a pretty much a complete history up until maybe like 1999 of the family's history in the cigar business. And I would venture to say, I, I, I don't want to speak at a turn here, but I would venture to say that as far as factories that are still operating to this day, there's probably no other factory that has the history that is contained within the single family yeah. in the cigar business and so this show tonight is going to be a great show for you folks if you're watching if you're cigar fans if you want to geek out a little bit on on cigars like sometimes we get off the rails and we don't talk a ton about cigars but tonight we're going to talk a lot about cigars and a lot about cigar history uh this is episode 240 smoke night live brought to you by the fine folks at jr cigars um so emmett uh before we bring bobby on to the show bobby newman will be our guest he's waiting in the green room right now. <laughs> um, uh, tell Just real quick, Emmett, your thoughts on J.C. Newman. Like, you've been around cigars for a long time, and you've known that name. But how much have you, you know, investigated and looked into, you know, what the company is, is really all about? You know, I didn't really know as much as I do now about the company until uh, The American came out last year. Everyone was talking about that. And so I, you know, kind of, Looked into that story, and then uh, you kind of get on a tangent from that one into learning, you know, more about the family's history and the history of that that factory itself, and what what all has happened there, and what all has happened to the family, and and how it's just been this perseverance throughout time here in this country of cigars. It's it's really amazing. I love it. Yeah, and if you are an American, which I am, I'm a red blooded, bourbon drinking, steak eating American. Uh, like most of the people watching probably are as well, you you have to appreciate the J.C. Newman Company because th this is a true blue American cigar company. And frankly, um, there's not a lot of those left. I mean, like uh, obviously, like most cigar companies have, you know, offices in Miami and stuff. But for the most part, they're they're newer companies and they make their cigars in Nicaragua or, or the Dominican Republic, mm -hmm. which also J.C. Newman does, but they have an operating factory still to this day producing cigars in America, yeah. which is incredible to me that that can still happen just economically. Like it seems like such a, a challenge, yeah, you know, because of the difference in, you know, pay scales and so on and so forth. So let's get let's dive into the J.C. Newman company tonight. Let's yes. bring on our guest, Bobby Newman, the executive vice president. Uh, president of J.C. Newman Cigars. Bobby, welcome to Smoke Night Live, my friend. Oh, well, thank, thank you, Eric. God, when I look at myself, uh, please tell the audience that makeup didn't show <laughs> in <laughs> I'm really not that losing that much hair. They, they were late. But thank you for having, having, having us on, our family on. We appreciate it. 
Um, I'm, I'm in my my favorite place in the world. I'm we're I am talking to you from, which is the back of our house. It's our cigar bar, and uh, we have heaters around us. We have about two days when we have to turn them on, and uh, uh, but it's it's a real pleasure to, to be here. And uh, uh, we uh, remember in my college years, I used to go out skiing in the uh, in Colorado, Breckenridge, and uh, uh, Steamboat. It's beautiful. And the only problem about going to Colorado in the summertime, the humidity is at 7%. It's when you come back to Tampa, the, the humidity <laughs> is oppressive. <laughs> yeah, right? Oh, my God. Yeah. So, so Bobby, it, it, it is. before we get into, uh, I want to you know dive deep into your family history and talk a little bit about this book that you that you so generously sent us. But uh, just real quick, um, how have things been going for you personally uh, in the last you know three to four weeks uh, with you know lockdowns, shelter in place, whatever you want to call it, quarantine, and so on and so forth. How how have you been doing personally, emotionally? You guys holding up well there in Tampa? Oh, oh, absolutely. You know, we're the oldest cigar company in the United States. Our grandfather started it in May of 1895. We've survived two world wars, the Great Depression, uh, the Cuban embargo, which uh, broke the back of the Tampa cigar industry, which was uh, the epicenter of the entire world uh, premium cigar business. And... Um, uh, we've been we've been fighting the uh, uh, FDA for for ten years, and we're we're getting closer to hopefully get them off our back. So we've seen a lot bigger things than this. As Americans, we will get through this. Um, just a, about four hours ago, it was announced um, on Fox News that uh, Jacksonville Beach is now going to be uh, open tonight at midnight. I don't know why they said midnight tonight, but. Uh, <laughs> The, I will say this, I, I started in 1975 full time. I started in the 60s uh, working uh, in the summertime at our company, our factory in Tampa. And, um, but, but since 1975, I've been traveling a great deal. Last year, I was gone like 40 weeks. I'm, I'm lucky I, I, I married way over my pay grade, so my <laughs> wife still talks to me. But this is the first time in, in uh, 45 years I haven't traveled. This is the longest I've been home. And, and probably wow. in my working life. And um, it's uh, er every state is different how they're handling the coronavirus, and the rules and regulations. And we're fortunate in Florida. Um, they, we're at any f factories can stay can stay open, continue to work. And uh, so we having a cigar factory, uh, we, we are running things. We, uh, as you know, the CDC said anyone over 60 years old, uh, they are, is the most they're mostly the most the people are most at risk so we told our there are a handful of employees who are that age and just if you want to go home that's fine uh we're paying everybody whether they're working or they're going home so uh, uh big things are, are things are going well i will say this it, it's uh most of the smoke shops in florida are closed uh, they're, they're doing curb service. Every state's different. You know, Michigan is probably maybe the, maybe the most the most strict. Uh, but uh, we do see light of the, as Americans, we see light at the end of the tunnel. I know right. if you watch the news, you see what's happening. Right. Yeah. So uh, so Bobby, um, I'm personally, and, and so is Emmett. Actually, we're yes. both smoking the Double Connecticut Brick House. We chose oh. that independently. We were both like, "This is what I want yeah. to smoke." Emmett it's brought it's Emmett, it's so good. Emmett brought it out. <laughs> Jordan's smoking it as well. Emmett brought his over, and unbeknownst to me, yeah. and uh, this is one of my favorite uh, cigars. What do you What do you have uh, fired up over there, Bobby? Well, I, I I'm smoking a uh, well, the Grandpa JC, the Diamond Crown, Ooh, Julius yeah. Caesar, okay. the good stuff. And uh, every one of our cigars has a story. The cigar you're smoking, the Brick House. Our cigars are like our children. How do you choose a? How can you choose a? How can you pick a favor? Oh, I can pick one though, easily. <laughs> Jordan, me. obviously. No, no. <laughs> but but I would tell you this though that uh, the Brick House that was one of Grandpa JC's first brands. The story behind Brick House, I, I, I think you know it, or maybe you don't. Uh, Grandpa JC came to United. He was born in 1875, and he came over with his. Uh, uh, four brothers and two sisters in 1875, 1888, 13 years old. 
Wow. And he lived in, he and his family lived in the only brick house in a little tiny eastern village in the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. And he named one of his first friends Brick House after that tiny brick house. And if you look at them, you open the box, and there's a picture of a, what the house looked like uh, when, when he lived there. And to, to honor his heritage, he, uh, he named, I say, one of the first brands, Brick House. He took it off the market in 1937. We don't know why. But we brought it back about 10, 11 years ago, and we did something I never thought never dreamed that we would do and that was we we built a factory in Nicaragua we opened it in 2012, 2011 and uh, we started making our brick house cigars there and um, the, um, the the wrapper is it's a it's an Ecuadorian wrapper uh, it is a Nicaraguan binder and it's a blend of Central and South American tobaccos but the it did very well uh, great got rated 92 which was uh, kind of the seal of good housekeeping. And uh, we, so we came out with a Maduro version called the, the uh, we have a six by 60, it's called the Mighty Mighty. One of our salesmen has named it, you know, the, you know, the, the, uh, the song. The Commodores. Yeah. Uh, right. The Commodores, right. So one of our salesmen, because well, we, we sit around, what are we gonna call this six by 60? So why don't you call it Mighty Mighty? So the Mighty Mighty, the Brickhouse Mighty Mighty, six by 60 Maduro. It's, it's rolled with an Era Paraca wrapper from Brazil. Not too many people use it. It's got a nice, it has almost like a sweet taste to it. Very flavorful, very smooth. And it's now the number one, the Brick House Mighty Mighty Maduro is the number one selling 6x60 uh, cigar in the United States, wow. Europe, uh, Germany, and Canada. Wow, nice. And, uh, so then we went to the third, what you all are smoking. Um, we had an idea. Let's come out with something probably no one's come out within a hundred years and that that's a hundred percent uh connecticut uh shade and connecticut broadleaf binder cigar and uh so that's real connecticut most people have left connecticut as uh the um, there's fewer there's fewer there's fewer acreage of connecticut real connecticut shade mm -hmm. being grown every year most people are using the connecticut seed grown in ecuador so that cigar is real connecticut shade Binders Connecticut Broadly Finder, which gives it that nice sweet taste. Yeah, what and I, it, it is. It is. What I really like about it, Bobby, is um, I'm one of those guys. I've said this so many times on the show. I'm sure people are sick of hearing me say it, but I'm a I'm a guy who likes the taste of the tobacco on my tongue, and if it has a little zing and a little like uh, salty saltiness to it, I really like that. And this Double Connecticut really has that like a little nice salty zing on my tongue, which is nice. And these cigars are like ridiculously affordable i mean this is not a cigar that's gonna set you back uh, a, a bunch bobby am i right that no. the uh, the original brick house was a, a clear havana cigar is that right yes it was and uh but when we moved to tampa our grandfather moved us in 1954 from cleveland he was 78 years old and he moved us to tampa at the time there were 10 large factories making 500 million cigars a year 500 million cigars That's using Clear Havana. The cigars were called Clear Havana, wrapper, binder, and filler. So it's 1954. 1961, the Cuban embargo came, and it, it broke the back of the, of the Tampa cigar industry. Tampa, it's still called Cigar City. Tampa was like, it's like uh, uh, wine to Napa Valley or automobiles to Detroit. And to this day, Tampa is still called the Cigar City. At one time, uh, one out of every three uh, citizens in Tampa worked in the cigar industry, either made cigars in the factory by hand or on these old hand-operated machines, or they worked in box factories. They worked in uh, factories that made uh, made nails and uh, hinges for the boxes. So the whole the, the Tampa's the whole epicenter was built around the cigar industry. Would you ever consider using uh, Cuban tobacco again in in a brick house or any other cigar? You know, if the embargo is is lifted one day. Absolutely, we welcome the day. We uh, there's still a Questeray factory in Cuba. Mr. Castro took everything, as you know, in 1960, 61. But uh, we would love to blend uh, our cigars with Cuban tobacco, and it's going to take a while to get the fields back up to to speed. And uh, but we welcome that day, and um, so. 
Um, if with every administration, you think, well, Cuba's going to open up. And uh, so the fact that it hasn't been open for, for so long is, is, is a miracle. It is, or, or I shouldn't say it's a miracle. It's, it just perplexes, uh, yeah. I think, everyone. So, so, Bobby, in just, I mean, I just got the book today and just thumbing, thumbing through the book um, and, and being captivated. Now, this was written uh, by your father. Is that correct? Stanford? Yeah, it was, it was, uh, dad told the story to, uh, it was, um, uh, it was written by, it's his story and it was, uh, we had a, someone else, his name is on the book. I forgot his name. Yeah, it's uh, uh, James Miller. James Miller from New York. Yeah, he put the book together mm -hmm. and, uh, it's something that you could give to anyone to put it on your coffee table at home because it's a history, not only of, of our family, but the entire cigar industry. It's got lots of pictures. Uh, there's one chapter dedicated to the Fuente family, we had a leverage to buy out in 1986, and Eric and I bought all 17 of our relatives out with my father, and um, we thought they got the uh, the mine and we got the shaft. This was <laughs> February 14th, 1986. It was uh, like a like a St. Valentine's massacre, <laughs> right. and uh, uh, so I, I remember like yesterday, and it, it, you know. God talks to all of us in different ways, and it's in the stories in the book. Uh, three weeks after a leverage buyout, uh, a man named Carlos Fuente, senior, who still had a factory he was in Tampa, he was operating uh, in Tampa. He wanted to close his factory. This is 1986, 30, what, 30, 34 years ago. Uh, and he asked us if we would make his, he was making three million cigars a year called Moya, M-O-Y-A. It's a, it's a, it was a bundle of cigar. He asked us if we would make uh, that cigar for him. And because um, uh, he wanted to concentrate on his new factory in Dominican Republic. He just got down there in 1980. I think most of your listeners know the story, the Fuente story. They went down uh, to Nicaragua and they got burned out by the Sandinistas. No insurance, moved over to Honduras, had an electrical fire, and they came back to Tampa in 1980, and uh, they ended up going to the Dominican Republic. And uh, so Carlos Sr., 1986, he wanted to close his factory in Tampa. So we said, yeah, we'll make the cigars, but we'd like to get back in the hand cigar making business. So we had, we one thing my father and, and grandfather had a lot of brands. So we took a brand called La Unica, La Unica in Spanish means the one and only and uh, it was a La Unica Dominican Primeros, which means Dominican first, up until night, till the, till we started making the D La Unica uh, cigar, or once they started making it, all the bundles that were sold in the United States were seconds. They would, they would have like tears in the wrapper or their green spots or uh, whatever, uh, rejects type. So we, it was my dad's idea to come out with these Dominican, these Dominican first, and Carlos Sr. picked the sizes, uh, at eight and a half by 52, seven by 50, six and three quarters by 44, and the Robusto, four and a half, four and three quarters by, by 50 ring gauge, and a Connecticut shade wrapper. He, we had a Maduro version, which, which was made with Connecticut broadleaf, and it took off. And um, then, uh, and remember, this was 1986. We were making 30,000 Quest Array a day in our in, by these hand operated machines. When you come to Tampa, we'll show you where, where it is, uh, where, where the, the big room is. It's, it's now holds uh, uh, a lot of the equipment uh, supplies for, for these hand operated machines. But uh, so Carlos once he said, Stafford, I can make Quest Array handmade. And he pulled out the box. He was making senior and Carlos Fuente Jr. were making boxes, beautiful boxes. We were using, uh, we used to use California Redwood, but we had a switch. And, uh, but the box is gorgeous, the cigars. So you can imagine a going from a Quest Array, long filler. We had four operators on these hand operated machines to completely handmade. And uh, we, we did. And we, I'd rather, I think we'd all lot rather be, we'd rather be lucky than good. Again, this was uh, in the late 80s, way before the cigar boom started. And, uh, uh, Quest Array took off before the cigar boom. Of course, in 1992 came things. The, it, the whole industry at the time, there were 100 million handmade cigars being imported. That's in Jamaica was very big back then too. You remember Royal Jamaica and Macanudo? Yeah, they were all made. Yeah. yeah. 
and uh, but it was a hundred million. It was the industry was flat, and then comes ni 1992, and uh, the industry goes from hundred million to over five hundred million. Yeah, that's the big, the big boom, right? The big cigar boom yeah. in the nineties. Now, before we get now, you're jumping ahead a little bit here because sure, um, sure. no, that's okay. I I love these stories. It's amazing. It's amazing to listen to this history, but the this book that. I'm thumbing through today is filled with like challenges that your family has, you know, faced and then somehow overcome. So just let's, let's start at the beginning. So like uh, JC Newman, Julius Caesar Newman is your grandfather. And then right. his son Stanford uh, is your father. So he's sort of like right. him and Milford were, were the two sons. Right. And then it comes to right, you, Miller. Bobby and Eric, you, you guys are, the next right. in line. And now Drew, assuming uh, uh, this goes the way it seems to keep going, he'll be sort of like the next generation. But way back right. in the day, there's the story in the book that really struck me as interesting, uh, Emmett. And, and they were, back in the day, I guess they were, there's a chapter in here called like the fatal penny. And back in the day, I guess like oh. cigars were essentially either five cents, they were 10 cents or they were 15 cents. That's the way, people bought cigars they were either five cents or ten cents and so on That's and right. your your company and your grandfather and your dad had uh, made a deal with this company to produce a million cigars a week for five cents uh, right um, and so the deal was essentially done right i mean according to the book the deal was essentially done so imagine that, that, yeah. a million a week at five cents that was going to be the price of the cigar but then as the deal's wrapping up and your father leaves the room, uh, your grandfather says that, okay, but they're going to be six cents. So he adds, he adds a <laughs> single penny. He adds a single penny to the price of the cigar that they're going to produce. And that single penny throws off the deal because the, the guy that you guys have made this deal with, this was like the, uh, the cameo bouquet cigar. Uh, he, right. he says, he says, I don't want a six cent cigar. I want a five cent cigar. And the deal, the deal goes down in flames. And your dad is, I can tell just by the text, he's distraught that, <laughs> that your grandfather, yeah, yes. yeah, that your grandfather right. added the cent to the, to the price and threw off the entire deal. But it's amazing now to think, you know, that the single penny, uh, sort of threw off this incredible deal that you guys had worked out. It is. It was. A, it was the largest distributor in the Midwest. We were operating in Cleveland, Ohio. It's called Niles and Mosier, and they they had distribution centers all over the Midwest. And uh, they they wanted a Nick. We were the cameo, and we still have a Quest Ray cameo. It's made by Fuente. It's in a little cigar like Esquisito in the tin, and um, but um, if you look and you think about that, so it's what's a penny? Well. You know, it's it's a, what mathematically it's an eighteen. If my math is right, it's it's one one six one six was that uh, mm. sixteen percent increase, almost seventeen percent increase. And this is a time when the uh, who was a famous president said, "What this country needs is a is a good nickel cigar." And that was that was when um, ninety percent of all cigars were were nickel, were a nickel. The premium cigars were fifteen cents. And um, so we lost that business. And I asked Dad uh, before he died about uh, what, what happened afterwards. He said, well, we lowered the price back to a nickel, but we never got the business back. Because right. Grandpa, he said he couldn't make money at a nickel. And uh, so that's... Isn't it amazing, uh, that, that isn't it, Bobby, isn't it amazing that, like, to, in today's world, like, with S-Chip and everything, Emmett, and, like, there's companies... It seems like every week we get a press release. You know, oh, this company's really ra raising their yeah. price, and it's understandable. Yeah. They're they're dealing with you know federal regulation, so we, I, I'm not judging them. I, it's totally understandable that they have to raise prices. But back then, a single cent was enough. I guess to, it kind of be like a dollar increase on your favorite cigar right now. Yeah, I right. mean, I, I could see. I, I'd be understanding if that happened, I guess. But a dollar, it's a well, lot. If you it's, could, it's a significant yeah. amount. Emmett, if you can imagine, all the cigars in America were were selling at ten dollars a piece, mm -hmm. and you go up to eleven dollars a piece, and times are tough. This was in the '30s yeah. and during the Depression, and uh, you couldn't raise it a, a half a cent. Right. And uh, but listen, I do want to tell you too. Um, 
uh, Eric and, and Emma, that that book is available. Uh, you can read it online. Um, if you go to, to jcnewman.com, uh, it's both dad's book, the book you have in your hand, and also Grandpa JC wrote a book when he was 80 years old called Smoke Dreams. It's like 70 pages long, and it starts out, I was born in 1875 in Corinth, uh, Austria, and uh, uh, and it's a very, you can read it in like an hour and a half, and uh, it's it's a different type of, uh, different story, uh, obviously, but it's it's, it's not as, um, I would say it's not as charming as Dad's books, but Dad's story, <laughs> you know, if you read uh, during the Great the, Dad was born 1916, and he uh, during the Great Depression, no one had any money. There's a story about how if you, uh, chapter in there uh, at lunchtime he used to would get a, a a big dill pickle and he would put it in the soup and it would sink, and uh, that's how he ate pickles through, throughout throughout high school. <laughs> so, Hey, uh, we're going to get into some more of the challenges that the Newmans have faced throughout history. And one of the things I'm going to ask when I come back from this commercial break is you just mentioned that uh, your grandfather wrote a book and then your dad wrote a book. So I'm just curious if there's any books in the future for <laughs> for either Bobby or Eric. And then maybe in the future, Drew will write a book, too. But before we get there, guys, this show is sponsored by JR Cigars, one of the world's largest online cigar stores. JR's inventory ranges from everyday bundled cigars to incredibly high-end boxes, including the brand-new exclusive Cabanas, crafted by the legendary Don Pepin Garcia. Don't forget to check out their social media pages, including YouTube, where they feature cigar reviews, interviews, and their weekly top five videos. Check out JR Cigars for all of your premium cigar needs. This is episode 240 of Smoke Night Live. I'm sitting here with Emmett from Blind Man's Puff. I've got my... Son and intrepid producer Jordan over there on the uh, on the technical side of things. Jordan, how are you doing tonight? Hidden behind the JR. How's <laughs> how's your uh, your brick house Connecticut going down? Smooth as butter. Smooth it's like butter oh. as butter. Wonderful. <laughs> so uh, so yeah, we're all here in Dojo Studios. We are uh, practicing a, an extreme close version of social. Distancing. No, we're actually like seven feet apart. It's just a really <laughs> wide yes. lens. It's like, a fisheye lens. Yeah. So. Camera adds a couple hundred pounds. That's amazing. That's <laughs> amazing. The camera uh, shortens up distances. So, uh, but no, we all took our temperature at the door. I and mean, you remember yes. I did, gave you the rectal this, thermometer. Like, infrared scanner. Oh, yeah. We hook yeah, up we to the iPad rectal. and everything. It's amazing. <laughs> it was uh, the rectal thermometer. <laughs> Emmett was a little <laughs> concerned about, but uh, uh, hey, uh, someone's got to do it. Yeah, so we're, we're visiting with uh, Bobby Newman, who's uh, third. He's the third generation of a fourth generation company which is awesome to me because getting to work with my son so what's it like having a, mm -hmm. the family bobby what's the the family company is amazing julius caesar newman then your father stanford then yourself and eric and now drew how do you is that how do you put that into perspective all those years a, over a century of a family-owned company that's been able to stick together all this time that's unique in today's world well, my grandfather used to tell the story to my father, who told us. He said, "Don't be, don't be like the story of the men and family shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves." We say, "Dad, what does that mean?" He said, "Well, back in the 1880s, company people would come over. The, fir the first generation would come over, and only wealthy people could afford long sleeves. Oh. A lot of extra cloth. So they start out in short sleeves. The first generation, they work as an American. They're American from overseas, Europe." Um, and they become very successful. The second generation sees how, how hard their father and mother worked. They worked very hard. Third generation, uh, which Eric and I are part of, are in, we are the third generation of our, of our family, um, they never saw how hard their grandfather worked. They don't have an appreciation for where they got to where they, the company did, and they go bankrupt. They go chapter seven, they close the company, and they have to go, they lose everything, and they have to go back to shirt sleeves. So that's where that. that I, I'm old... still at the tank top level, Bobby. I'm just tank top. He's in a swimsuit from the yeah. bottom down. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so, so well, no, seriously, my uh, if we had been with our family uh, members, uh, Grandpa JC had uh, two sons and two daughters. We we bought the whole, and they, we had in laws, outlaws, and so forth. And all, all I like out. that. And uh, it's it's very very rare. If, to have a family cigar company, I'm sorry, to have any family business succeed to survive into the third generation. Because oh, no what happens to third generation 
if it's successful, they'll end up selling uh, the company. Mm -hmm. you know, why do I want to you know, work? Why do I want to travel and bust my butt? And uh, which is which is normal uh, because of our leverage buyout. Um, when we had our leverage buyout in February of 1986, we the company uh, we had a net negative net worth, and for four years we worked seven days a week, and we never saw this this boom coming. Obviously. But uh, I will say the, the greatest help is when Carlos Fuente, uh, uh, not only did he uh, want, a lot, want us to make his cigars, the, the Moya, but he also said, we said, well, we'd like to sell your cigars, Arturo Fuente. And we started FANCO, F-A-N-C-O, Fuente Newman Company. The first year we started, we opened, because we had a sales force, uh, nothing wrong with cigar brokers or any food brokers, but uh, cigar brokers, traditionally have many, they have multiple brands. We had a dedicated sales force and we were explained to Carlos and Carlito, hey, well, let's use our sales force and we'll sell our Toro Fuente. The first year we opened, I have the record still, we opened up 501 new accounts. And I remember the, the Fuentes couldn't believe it. It was, again, this was 19, you know, the, the late eighties and way before the boom. And uh, we, we had a great sales force. We just didn't have the product. And, uh, so what happened is, is to quote Carlos Fuente, senior and junior, two plus two equal five. So there's so much synergy there. And we've been their business partners uh, for 34 years, since 1986. And it's been a wonderful marriage. Uh, we, uh, we sell Arturo Fuente to all the brick and mortar in the United States. They make all of our Dominican cigars. And uh, they, they're the, we think they're the best manufacturer. They have the largest stock pile of aged tobacco. Uh, we, um, the longer you age tobacco, the smoother it becomes. It's like scotch. When we opened our factory in 2011 in Nicaragua, uh, J.C. Newman Pensa, um, it was designed to make 40,000 cigars a day. And we said, well, you know, what happens if the business grows? We have to make 50,000. Well, don't worry about it. Eric and I said to each other, well, today we're making a little over 100,000 cigars a day. And we've had five expansions. Our our biggest expansion is the one that just completed, and that's uh, so we now we can stockpile and age um, hundreds and hundreds of bales of tobacco. Uh, the cigar, the brick house we're making in 2011, or let me put it this way: the brick house we're making today are better than the ones that were uh, that we were making in 2011 because we're able to, to to age tobacco longer and longer. Sure. You really have to age tobacco three, four years. To, to do it right under the right conditions. Um, it's funny, I, you never knock your competition, but uh, a, a friend of ours, uh, Dave Garofalo, remember he went to Cuba a couple of years ago. I said, uh, Dave, how long do they age uh, cigars in Cuba? To age, are you kidding? They make the cigars, put them in the box and sell them. And uh, so that's the way they do it and, that, and that's fine. But uh, hey, that's, that's the secret. You know, if you to have a consistent cigar, you have to have, you have to buy tobacco and age it yourself. You cannot buy aged tobacco, as you know. So, Bobby, um, uh, let's talk a little bit about the building there in Ybor City. Like that, that's a landmark. You can't go through, you can't go through Tampa without seeing the Cuesta Rey building there. It's it's impressive. You see the big Cuesta Rey sign. It looks amazing. The clock tower. Um, and I, I don't want to talk yet about the um the renovation project we'll talk about that a little bit later but sure. uh, talk ab about the acquiring of that building and what that building means to not just uh, tampa but the cigar industry as a whole like that that is a landmark that has uh symbolic and significant meaning that kind of goes beyond just the bricks that's it's built of itself like that building it means something it does. Uh, Martinez Ebor. We are in Ebor City. It's Y B O R. Uh, he brought the cigar industry from Key West in 1886. So between 1886 and 1910, uh, our factory was built in 1910. It's one of the oldest. Uh, it was like the last factory built in in Ebor City. But uh, when that factory was built, 1910, uh, it was built, built. It was owned by the Regensburg family, a family from Germany, and it was built as the largest cigar factory and build as uh, publicized as the largest cigar factory. They had 1,500 hand cigar makers in there. 
you can imagine. Wow. And the, le the lector, the reader, uh, if you've been to Cuba, which I've never have been, but all the factories in Tampa before they had before their electricity in, in the 1880s and before they had radios and light bulbs, they had um, uh, every where the, where the cigar making floors were. They had a stage, and each cigar maker, each hand cigar maker, would pay a penny to two pennies a week, and they would give it to the lector. Lector in Spanish in English means reader. And they would read the newspaper. They would read novels because making cigars was very tedious. And it's funny we have these, these pictures of the cigar rollers, very chauvinistic, all males. They all wear either wore a tie or a bow tie. Many of them have hats on. And uh, so well, we we are built. We we'll talk about that later. But we're building a hand cigar factory on the third floor, and uh, we we have just completed our lector stand. So when you come see it, you'll see. Uh, uh, you'll see the, the reader reading in Spanish to our hand cigar makers, and uh, the where the factory is situated is on it's one block off of Interstate Four, and uh, Interstate Four I four it goes from the uh, Gulf of Mexico all the way to Daytona Beach, and it bisects Florida, and politically it's uh, they say the presidential races are going to be. You, you win Florida by, by winning the I-4 corridor because mm. it goes, we're, we're 70 miles from the Walt Disney World gates. And uh, so that area, it goes from Clearwater, St. Pete Clearwater to Tampa, to Orlando, to Daytona Beach. And the population is booming there. People want to move to Florida because uh, there's no state income tax. So we have a lot of uh, athletes, and golfers, uh, great uh, basketball players living in Florida as well. But the city, the, this is the working the factory, which was built in 1910, it has a clock tower in it. It goes up 80 feet in the air. And before uh, only that 1910, only very wealthy people could afford those watches, those, uh, those Dawson, what do you call those watches uh, like you, you put on your pocket watch? A pocket watch. And uh, this is, no one had wrist watches back then. So people would go to sleep by the the sound of the clock. They, we had a, it looks like the Liberty Bell. Every hour it would ring, and they would they would go to bed that way, and they would uh, wake up that way. Mm -hmm. And it was just like if you go to Nicaragua and Esteli at six o'clock in the morning, you hear the air raid siren. First time I heard that, my brother didn't warn me like twenty years ago. <laughs> it hot of me. You know, I said, God, it's like Torah, 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 or something incoming. But uh, so this. The, it's an it is an iconic building. It's a beautiful, beautiful building, and um, it's we're, we're so proud of it. We're doing things that, uh, that we'll talk about when you're ready to talk about it. And Eric and I wouldn't have done, but the fourth generation it wants to, to do something very special there. All right. Yeah, I I, I think we should talk about the uh, the renovation. I that's yeah. to me that's the most uh, interesting it. topic that that has come out of uh, what I've been reading about the company lately. Um, I know you, you. It's an extensive process, and you guys are, are have been remodeling for years. Uh, has what's the progress like percentage wise right now in terms of what you want to renovate that factory? Well, the the first part was was uh, is was completed last year. That was uh, moving our shipping department. Uh, we, shipping department was built 25 years ago. We long outgrown it, so we moved it the shipping department to where our bonded warehouse is, which is three times the size. The second part is. And this was Drew's idea, and Eric and I would not have done this, but uh, like er if Eric were here, he would tell you that uh, he's I hope he's watching tonight. He said, "Son, if you want to spend your inheritance, then go ahead, because uh, <laughs> we're gonna." Drew Drew had an idea. Let's let's renovate the the factory. Uh, people love to come when they come to Tampa. They they love they always visit Ybor City. It's it's kind of like the French Quarter. It's this rich heritage of heritage and cigar making. Uh, you go down 7th Avenue in Ybor City and there's uh, lots of cigar uh, cigar shops. There's a, there's a lot of one and two man operations or women operations making cigars by hand. Uh, but what Drew wanted to do is open the factory, let's renovate it, let's renovate the first floor, increase the size of the cigar museum, we'll open it to the public. The second floor will have a, a, a mini theater there and a cigar smoking area. The third floor, let's put a, uh, where we're currently making the American, which is another idea Drew had, uh, make a handmade cigar, 
to make handmade cigars in our factory. The third floor, let's put a cigar rolling factory up there. Enough, uh, we'll have 14, uh, uh, 14 hand cigar making tables, a sorting table and a lector. And uh, where people can come to visit, open to the tourists, to friends, to customers, uh, they can visit the factory, they can uh, tour the factory, uh, they can uh, make, uh, we'll teach them how to make cigars by hand, they can do their own blending, they can do, we'll have cigar promotions in there. And uh, if you if you fly into Tampa, Florida right now, and you land in the American Airlines terminal, uh, there's, we have a sign that's about 30 feet long, 10 feet high, it says, Welcome to Cigar City. And now we're going to change it, we're going to put it on all the terminal uh, entrances, uh, it will say, uh, come visit the last working cigar factory in Cigar City. Nice. And uh, nice. we, we expect to, we want to, it's our gift to Cigar City to, uh, in, in celebration of our 125th anniversary. And um, we're, we're, obviously, we're very, very excited about it. Yeah. And uh, so I've seen some examples, but to you, what's the coolest thing? that you found while renovating that was kind of unexpected that you like stumbled across? I know there's some cool examples, uh, but what's your oh favorite? My, I, I'd say this was, this was shocking too. Um, you know, if we've been there since 1954, we've owned the building. So we're doing renovation. We're in the basement. And as you know, Florida has no basements. We're at the highest point in Tampa, which is our elevation is 12 feet. You know, you're at 5,200 uh, feet. So no, they're the only the only known basements in the state of Florida are in these old cigar factories, and you have the basement, and then you have three or four floors above you. And uh, so we're, we're cleaning out the basement, and we found a trap door in the basement, and we opened it up, and it was it was like something out of an Alfred Hitchcock movie. <laughs> the, the wood looked perfect. There's no dust. Like oh my god, where does this go to? So it went upstairs and it went to the um, to where the where we had a, a, a copy. It was called our, our Xerox room, and uh, we found out the story that uh, during the 30s, mafia was very powerful in Tampa, and once a week, the mafia would would well let me back up. All the cigar factories they pay their employees in cash, not not checks, and once a week or once a week, once every two weeks. The mafia would come and they would rob a factory, and uh, they Jeez, no one could do anything about it. Those are my it. ancestors. <laughs> those, are, those are my ancestors. <laughs> family I, history I, over I here. I apologize for that right now. Yeah. That's okay. But it was, so what happened when uh, the word got around? Hey, we they're coming to they're coming to rob us. Then the plant manager who was upstairs, he would take the cash. He would go down this secret passage. When you come to Tampa, we'll show it to you. It's on the tour, by the I way. Yeah. It, yeah. But, uh, and uh, they would go out that they would go down in the basement and then they would escape. Uh, there was a secret passageway to go outside. And uh, that was that was the, probably the neatest thing that we found. That's, that's really cool. That's amazing. You know, like so like I've been there a couple of times in the last couple of years. And so I, I've sort of seen the progress. And when when Bobby says that they're re, re- renovating this, it's. it's Wow. What we got going Ooh, on? We got a cougar know. in the I background. Sounds like, a, is it, it sounds like there's a little cat fight. Like a, is there a tiger, <laughs> tiger, tiger King, king going on? Is Joe yeah, exotic? Yeah. It's Carol, there. watch out. Yeah. You know, he's in Rotary with us, or, or he was. <laughs> so That's I now I have my wife and two sons out of here. So, Bobby, now I've seen the progress <laughs> going on. And when you say renovate, like, I'm not sure, like, people realize, like, this is not just a renovation. I mean, you guys are, like, tearing it down to the brick level. Ripping out, yes. ripping out what was, you know, maybe built in the 60s or 50s or 40s and that kind of stuff. And you're literally, you know, re you know, re renovating it back to the way it, it was initially. So my my question is, this was initially supposed to be opened in May. Is are we is that still like on schedule or are we? Or is it-, it is on schedule. Be, again, the state of Florida allows uh, construction. Uh, projects and factories to remain to open to, to work so yeah it's we're we're on target to open um, at the end of may and we were going to have a big uh celebration uh which you were invited to uh may 30th and that's been pushed back to uh, to sometime in october okay october uh, right and we'll send you save the date on that oh yeah but that's uh, something i do not want to miss i yeah. mean that just looks like the stuff that you know, you know we went through the last time 
you had made you know dramatic progress there was sections of the building that had you know literally they were just a, basically like a skeleton of bricks and um right. and yeah. and so like we've been on the roof and hanging out that there's just something you know you really magical about that building and i think that any if you're like in if you're a cigar nerd and you're into this like yeah. me and emmett are like that's something that is just going to be a destination it's going to be a yeah. destination for cigar smokers to go and and check out and be able to kind of see not just read about and hear about but you'll be able to sort of see the history and you don't need a passport no you don't need it, a, yeah. no no and that and that's the best part that, that's the, really the best if you can just stay in the united states you know, the uh, the bourbon trail has certainly been an inspiration to to us uh you go to kentucky to, to what is it 10 or 8 10 or 12 uh of these distilleries and this we want to make this like the bourbon trail uh there's only one there's only one one factory and that that's us and uh, this is Jeannie our, from Southeast <laughs> our, our, our labs. But uh, so it's, um, uh, we, we're very, very excited about it. Uh, as, as I said, you know, the bathrooms, it's funny, we're all in temporary quarters. Um, the, uh, the bathrooms were built in 1910, so that's what we're using right now. The main thing is we're not ADA compliant. We do a lot of fundraisers in our factory um, and uh, we, we, we didn't have a wheelchair ramp and we have people that, that are in wheelchair and we'd have to carry them up. Now, now we have two wheelchair. We have one in the front of the factory and we have now one in, in the, the back of the factory. So, uh, we need to become ADA compliant and which we, which we are and, uh, uh which will be good. You know, we've got people want to have, uh, we have in the past, we've had, uh, uh, for friends and some of our employees uh, who want to get married there. Uh, and now we're going to be, it's going to be a, a great venue for this. And it's so good, not, not because we're in the cigar industry, but the, the work that you do at Cigar Dojo is so good. It, sure, it's great for us, but it's, it's great for everyone in the cigar industry. It's great for the customers, it's great for the retailers, great for the consumers, and it, uh, hopefully it's great for you because you're telling the story and the things like this didn't happen. I mean, here, I'm sitting here in Tampa, Florida, it's about 80 degrees out. It's high humidity. And I'm uh, talking to you, and we're talking to people, not, not only over the United States, but all over the world. I mean, how great is that? No, that's and, amazing, uh, right? I mean, things have changed. In fact, that kind of leads me into my next question to you is, if, if you could channel your grandfather, uh, J.C. Newman, and you told him that in today's world, some of your cigars sell for 18 to $20 Per stick, how do you suppose he would react to that? Well, the best way I can answer that is I remember when my father bought the Quest, our father Stanford, he bought the Questa Ray brand from the Questa family, and um, we couldn't. Just a button. I'm sorry. Um, the most popular, the most expensive cigar, the bulk of the premium industry, all with a uh, long filler, 100% uh, uh, tobacco cigar, was 26 cents. And so dad buys, buy, Grandpa J.C. Grandpa J.C. dies in 1958. Uh, he didn't want to expand. Dad, within a year, dad bought the Cuesta Ray brand from the Cuesta family. We only had a, a, a regional distribution in in in, not even in, in Tampa, in Florida. It was just Cleveland and the Midwest, St. Louis, Kansas City. My father knew that for us to survive, we had to, buy, we had to be a national company. So he bought Quest, and they had distributors all over the country. The Quest Array had a factory in, in uh, Cuba, and all the, the cigars were all clear Havana, wrapper, binder, filler. That's 1959. Two years later, there's no more Cuban tobacco. There's an embargo. So my dad, <clears throat> our father, was the first American to bring Cameroon tobacco into the United States. And that was no but, easy feat. I mean, you had to, like, buy it from, like, the French government and stuff, right? I mean, it was, right. it was like, a hard thing to, to do. Go, oh, it was, it was a real pain. You had to go to France, and you had to go a two-week auction. And uh, uh, my father took it, my brother and I in 1970, a thousand years, that's 50 years ago. <laughs> but the reason I'm telling you this story, so we started making, so dad came out. Uh, with Questory number 95, everyone was selling cigars for 26 cents. 
dad said, we're going to come out with a cigar. And they were all box pressed, by the way, like mm. Barry Plaza, Professor Garcia, Gold Label. So dad said, we're going to come out. It's his ideas. He was always an innovator. Quest Ray 95, the cigars will be in the round. And we're going to have a bundle of, they'll be like in bundles of, with a beautiful yellow ribbon, uh, 25 cigars, uh, Half the box, well, it'd be two bundles of 25, be a box of 50 cigars, sell for 35 cents. People love the taste. Listen, in 19, 1964, we brought our first bale to, of Cameroon tobacco, and no one ever, they couldn't even pronounce Cameroon. No one even knew where Cameroon, <laughs> Africa was. And, but the reason I'm saying the story, so, and prices, and that was a bad time during inflation. I remember my father came out with a cigar, a 7 by 50 ring gauge cigar. And it was going to be a dollar cigar. Oof. And he said, if you're, if you said, he said, he told Eric and me, that said, if your grandfather knew that we were making <laughs> selling cigars for a dollar, he oh, would have rolled yeah. over <laughs> his grave. That was a pretty big cigar for that time, too. I mean, it's amazing. 50 oh, it was, it was huge. It was the biggest cigar. Uh, it, it was huge. Yeah. What do you make and, of that? Like, you, you guys do the Mighty Mighty. That's like a 60 <laughs> ring gauge, right? And I, I read one of the stories in the book is uh, at one point, uh, the the company J.C. Newman took a chance and made a 47 ring gauge cigar, thinking that like maybe this is like too too big of a ring gauge. <laughs> like nowadays, I mean it's people small. are people are doing like you know 60, 70, 80, which is insane to me. But <laughs> it's kind of funny, right? No, it is. The way we've been able to survive is by innovation. My father had a a, a dream of coming out. We had a brand called Rigoletto. We still make it, and it's named after the Italian opera. So he wanted to come out with a Rigoletto, a Rigoletto Blackjack with a 47 ring gauge. And at the time, the biggest ring gauge, ring gauge is really 40, 43, 44. And uh, he, he, so he came out with this Blackjack and uh, the thing took, it was made with, it, we still make it in our factory in Tampa. And it's made with Connecticut Broadleaf Tobacco. Wow. But I tell you, you talk about innovation, uh, uh, Diamond Crown. Which an old label, and you've the labels have been market, and also in the 30s, the label, the original labels were uh, were very ornate. But uh, Dad said, he told Eric and I, he said, before my 80th birthday, we're going to come out with a cigar, diamond crown, 54 ring gauge cigars, and it and uh, it says it's going to be made with Connecticut shade. Again, this was 19. Let me see, 19. Um, have to stop for a second. 19, 19 uh, early 90s, and uh, Dad said, uh, "I use Connecticut Shade. That was the most popular wrapper at the time, and it's going to be uh, it's going to be four and a half by 54, five and a half, six and a half, all the way to eight and a half by 54. The largest ring gauge molds that were made were 52. So we got together with with Carlito and Carlos." And uh, they made, they got them, they ordered the molds. And Eric and I were so concerned. We said, Dad, what happens if somebody wants to buy a diamond crown with a smaller ring gauge? And Dad said, let them buy someone else's. He oh. said, before oh. I die, we're going to come out. It'll be the best cigar that's ever been made. Double fermented Connecticut shade wrapper. Uh, I don't care how much it costs to make. I don't care how much we sell it for. I don't care if we sell any. But this, is, <laughs> this will be my legacy. Nice. Wow. And uh, that's, and boy, it, so we, we launched it in 1996 at the Grand Havana Room in Beverly Hills, California, and uh, we, we it was great. It's it's it is. If Carlito were here, he would tell you he does not make a better Connecticut Shade cigar than the Diamond Crown Classic, and it's done very well. Uh, five years after that, uh, America's taste changed. He wanted stronger, uh, heavier beer. He wanted heavier. Uh, uh, Whiskies, they wanted heavier food. So we came out with the Diamond Crown Maximus, which is an Ecuadorian wrapper. The, and that plant is a, it's a Havana seed, but at the very top of the plant, much heavier cigar. And uh, then Drew came up with an idea. Let's, let's honor Grandpa JC. It's a, let's come out with a cigar called Julius Caesar. And we played around with this for two years. So that was Probably, Drew's idea, huh? It was, it was Drew's wow. idea. We, I was against it. And... Uh, <laughs> You know, Diamond Crown out there for Julius Caesar, but we we finally settled it. We put it, this Diamond Crown Julius Caesar. Uh, it's our highest rated cigar, 96 rated. It's it's um, it's 
uh, obviously all the Diamond Crown and Quest Array and La Unica, they're all made in Dominican Republic by the Fuente family. But uh, the Diamond Crown Julius Caesar, they're in leather boxes to honor his, his heritage. And uh, so then uh, somebody, uh, Eric came up with an idea, what, Andrew, let's, we talked about, we need a heavier cigar. You know, as you know, every, if you go into a smoke shop and people always, they, they always want something new, but they always want something that's mild, especially new smokers. They don't want to get their head blown off. But we felt like we needed a heavier diamond crown, so we, we developed the uh, black diamond. And the wrapper, it's, it's a Havana seed crone in Connecticut. There's not a lot of it around, but it uh, has a very unique taste, but you have to have a you have to have a steak at Morton's before you smoke it. That's all. <laughs> hey, uh, Bobby, um, speaking of that, uh, is it challenging for you guys as a company being around for over a century to, you know, remain relevant to, you know, today's modern cigar smoker? Because you mentioned, and it's true, um, the modern cigar smoker sort of has changed and now it's, a little bit more like the craft beer model where people are wanting, you know, they always want the newest thing. I was on a, a round table yesterday with Pete Johnson and John Huber and Matt Booth and those guys. And they were saying right. the most frustrating thing to them is they come out with a new cigar. And the first thing out of the person's mouth that they hand it to is what's, what do you got coming out next? Right. It's like, yep. yeah, it's, oh, this oh, is it. Is. I just handed you the brand new cigar. So how does a company like JC Newman being around so, and have this rich history, you know, how do you, how do you try to stay relevant with, you know, the modern day cigar smokers? Well, that, that's a great question. And I know a, a lot of these boutique brands, uh, they, I'm not, we're not, we're not mention anyone's names or they, it's like they, they, they come out with a, a new brand uh, or new every three months. Uh, it takes us two to three years to come out with a cigar. Um, God, the Black Diamond, we worked on it for two, two and a half years. Julius Caesar, we worked on for two years or more. Um, we're, we're always working on new things, but um, we, um, uh, I, I admire Jonathan Drew, what he has done. And, and Pete Johnson, they're all good friends of ours. Uh, we all work together uh, legislatively uh, to to uh, get the FDA off of our back. We have a different business model, though. Um, we do come out with new products, uh, line extensions, but um, we feel like we're the um, kind of like the story of the of the of the, of the tortoise and the hare, and. Uh, we're, we're, we're definitely the, the tortoise when it comes to... Uh, <laughs> There's to, nothing wrong with being that. Nah, tortoise wins, right? Tortoise, uh, tortoise wins in the end, so... Yes. Emmett, you got a, another a, a kind yeah, of a final question? I'm curious. You mentioned um, that you're turning the third floor of that factory into a, a hand-rolled uh, section factory. Um, right. Do you envision like moving some current lines to be made there or, or something totally new that you're going to come out with? Great, great, yeah, thank you. Know, the American, because we have two rollers now. They each make uh, 100 uh, American cigars uh, a, uh, a day. That's all. That's, we, we cap the production and because they all go through a draw master. Uh, that's that's Drew's project uh, with the Florida Sun Grown Jeff Borch Wits's mm -hmm. product, wrapper. Uh, he grows 20. 20 miles north of uh, Walt Disney World. It's a Connecticut Broadly Finder, and it's the, the filler is grown by the Mennonites, the long filler. But uh, we, we want to come out with um, we we have access to Cameroon tobacco, and uh, thanks to Carlos Fuente. I like where this is going. <laughs> yeah, and so yeah, we yeah we want to start rolling uh, nice. cigars. Eric and I were weaned on Cameroon tobacco, but we want to we we want to make different blends, different types of wrappers, and we're, and also with. We want to uh, have have uh, uh, tastings, rolling classes, seminars up there. Uh, we have so many people that want to come down, our tobacconists and, and, and consumers also. And everybody wants to come to Florida in the wintertime, especially. So now they have someplace to go. They visit a cigar factory, hang out, uh, and um, learn. We think it's it, – is it good for J.C. Newman? Absolutely. But it's also good for the entire cigar industry, too. And uh, we are we're very active politically, and uh, to, we want to keep uh, no tax. We want to keep the tax. We have no cigar tax in Florida, like like New Hampshire, and uh, 
uh, in Pennsylvania. We want to keep it that way. I told our children, uh, Dawson and Paxton, if you guys want to come in our industry, you're going to have to be politically active. And just like you have to walk the halls, I took Dawson up, our, whom you met earlier, uh, took him to Washington when he was a senior in high school, and he ended up being an, an intern up there for our U.S. Congresswoman and uh, Kathy Castor. And today, you've got to you've got to be on your toes politically, uh, it, uh, because um, there's people always wanting to uh, raise our taxes, put us out of business, and so forth. Everything is competitive, but when you compete against the government, you have to have uh, uh, lobbyists and, and support. So, uh, but I tell you, I'm more bullish. I'm, I'm more bullish today than I was last year on the industry, and er every year. If you travel around the country, there's 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 smoke shops, there's there's cigar bars popping up everywhere, and we go to Dortmund every year, and well, which is the big, it's like the the IPCPR. Uh, that's something that you have you ever been to Dortmund? No, I have not. To the three, inner tobacco, amazing. Right. It's bigger than the IPCPR, and uh, we had um, uh, this this year we had our own booth. We used to have a booth always with our importer Arnold Andre, and um, we had our own booth and um, a large booth, and we met people. Uh, uh, we do a lot of business in Europe, and uh, we're fortunate in, it's growing despite all the anti. And you have to put some of those countries, you have to put these terrible health warnings on. But despite that, the young people are smoking cigars there. There's such an interest in cigars. I, how how can this be? We think it's because of the internet. They're curious about it, and cigars just. You go any place in America, and you you see two people smoking a cigar in a smoking lounge, and they don't have to know each other; instant friends. Right. It's it's one of the few things. It will slow you. It can it will slow you down. Right. And uh, it's just it's such a it's such a great you know the the FDA came out. Uh, I know we got to go a real quick story. FDA came out in 2017. Mm -hmm. Drew, Drew found this this the articles, and the FDA had two conclusions. Uh, they said. After a long study that youth, mean children or kids, boys and girls under 18 do not smoke handmade cigars, premium cigars. And the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, concluded, and this is all in writing, that, uh, that the average American cigar smoker smokes 1.7 premium cigars a month, and it will not affect mortality. And they we took that information. They, they don't know the they don't know the guys on the dojo. But, uh, <laughs> no, I, I got I, uh, Bobby. First of all, uh, before I just got to tell you, thank you so much for yes. an incredible evening. I mean, the passion that you have and and the history that that you shared with us tonight was just amazing. And I I just want to thank you so much. But I, a final question: It seems like you know you're the four generations. You know, you have J.C. Newman, your grandfather. You have your dad, Stanford. You have you and Eric, the third generation, and then Drew coming up. You've all, you're all either have faced or facing like incredible challenges to continue on. And of course, Drew will face his own challenges as he, you know, takes the gauntlet, you know, into the next generation, and then hopefully his kids will take it from there, and it'll be five generations. But I, right. this is a rough question, and I hate to put you on the spot, but who do you suppose out of all those generations has faced? or will face the hardest challenges of them all? Was it your grandfather? Like, yeah, you know, like uh, forging, yeah. forging this company to start with, or was it your, your dad who brought it down to Tampa and had to deal with, you know, uh, the, the Cuba crisis. And then, or was it, you know, you and Eric dealing with now, not only going through the cigar boom, but now the FDA, or is it Drew who is going to face, who knows what sort of challenges in the future? Like, oh, yeah. What 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 generation faced and dealt with the the roughest challenge of them all and and will succeed or or did succeed? That that, that no one's at, it's funny I've been asked a lot of questions. Uh, if Eric, and hopefully again Eric is listening, he would tell you that uh, we've been in business 125 years and 100 and a uh, hundred of those years have been enormous challenges and uh, from the Cuban embargo to the Great Depression. To World War One and World War Two, um, that I think that they'll first of all, um, I hope our sons Daw Dawson and, and Paxton will come in the industry as well and, and be with their cousin Drew. But we are, Eric and I are standing on the shoulders of giants. 
Mm. We're standing on my my our father standing on his father, our kids and Drew are standing on our shoulder. will be standing on our shoulders as well. Every, every generation has its own challenges. Sure. Um, the um, uh, We never dreamed this, this S chip would come apart uh, or come upon us. Uh, it, it woke our family up, it woke the Fuente family up and uh, the rest of the industry. If you don't have a voice in Washington, you will get run over and we will act. I, You've got to be active in Washington, no matter what industry you're in or service you're in. Um, but th there'll be other ch challenges. But the 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 one of the, the secrets of our longevity has been we've we've been innovators yeah. and we've been able to uh, to find ways to to survive and, and to prosper. Yeah, no doubt about it. I mean, I I recommend everybody to get this book to snag it because I just started thumbing through it today and and I was like um. I'm just going to look at the pictures because I didn't have time. There's some great pictures. I, I got it today, and I was like, I'm just going to look at the pictures. But I couldn't help but start reading some of the chapters because it's so you know, engaging. The, cha the challenges to me uh, and overcoming those challenges is the most interesting aspect of this. And we face our own challenges, Emmett, with what we do. But, man, nothing like <laughs> what goes on yeah. in, in, in the – in the pages of this book. So if you can snag We've had that. a couple of viewers buy the book during the show, during the show, people hey. have been buying the book. So uh, that's fantastic. Right. Thank you guys. So Bobby, well, thank you so much for taking the time on a Friday night to be with me and Emmett. Yeah. It's been great. Uh, it's our pleasure. We look forward to seeing you and hope all of your viewers and listeners will come out, come visit us after May. And then <laughs> when we're finished for part, part two of the uh, factory and come on, well, We'll, we'll teach you how to make cigars, and uh, you can do your own blending. So thank you all for listening. Thank you for, the, for I tell you, uh, Eric, Jordan, Emmett, thank you for inviting us into your living room as uh, well. I appreciate that. Hey, hey, Bobby, don't go away. I want to talk to you for just a, a couple seconds after the show. But, guys, sure. this is it, uh, Dojo. Uh, it's Friday night. Uh, by the way, Wednesday, Flavor Odyssey. Robbie and Randy are on into the wild card episodes of Flavor Odyssey. So they'll be pairing. Uh, they're going to redo – some pairings in these wild card episodes. And this week, one of the redos is uh, Cigar City's Brewing uh, Maduro, I believe. Uh, they're going to be, be pairing that with another cigar because earlier in the season, the pairing didn't go so well. So they're going to try to make a better pairing out of it. So I wish we could find that out here. Yeah, that'll be fun to check that out. We've got some heavy hitters coming up on Smoke Night Live. Next week, Alan Rubin will be on the show. Ooh. Then we're going to do a special Monday episode that's April 27th, and we'll have Nick Perdomo on because it's Perdomo Monday. Ah, I see so what you did there. Nick Perdomo will be on a special Monday episode of the show. Um, then we'll have uh, Klaus Kellner will be coming on the show. Love that guy. We're going to have a special contest for that week. Uh, we'll be asking you guys to supply us questions, hard, hard-hitting questions <laughs> uh, about – making cigars, growing tobacco, and we'll be giving prizes away for the best questions. So Klaus will be on in a few weeks. That'll be fun. And Emmett, check this out. This Monday, I sh uh, this is breaking news. Ooh. Breaking news. This Monday at around lunchtime, we're going to be doing a kind of a special live show during all this quarantine and lock-in. Randy Griggs is going to be teaching us Spanish. So Whoa. the idea is if you if That's you cool. yeah, if you go to a, a cigar safari or if you go to the Camacho Camp Camacho or you go to visit Perdomo factory in Esteli, a lot of us myself included, I don't like I'm on the airplane, I get off the airplane, people start talking to me, I don't I don't know what to say. <laughs> like I li I I want to know Spanish. But I'm just, I don't know it. I'm terrible at it. Well, now's your chance. And so now is my chance. We're going to basically be taking you through getting off the airplane, getting into a taxi, going to your hotel. How do you check into the hotel? What do you say to the person, right? And then going to the factory and asking pertinent questions, going to restaurants. What do you say in Spanish? How do you say it? So if you guys want to learn Spanish with me. Cigar style. Cigar style. <laughs> We're going to start doing that on Mondays. Randy, we'll, we'll probably have some special guests along the way, which will be a ton of fun. But uh, we'll we'll just go on. We're gonna go live this Monday for the first episode, cigars in Spanish. I don't even know how it's gonna happen. Anything can happen. Anything can happen, but it's gonna be a ton of fun. So uh, join us for that on Monday. This Monday will be the first episode of that. It'll awesome. be a lunchtime show on Monday, which should be a good time, guys. 
Everybody, please stay safe. I think we are on the downhill side of this thing. It's time to get back rolling. I think we all realize we have to get back rolling. To all the guys that have had got this sickness, and there's been some dojo guys that I, I love very much that have really had a rough go and got this sickness. And I'm so sorry. Thank God that they have... Uh, that they're on the downhill side of this. I don't want to say any names because I don't want to make the guy get a, a zillion emails or whatnot, but there's some some of your favorite dojo people that are, in fact, one of them right there in Ybor, near Ybor City is a huge dojo supporter, and he had a, a really, really rough go at this. I'm not going to say who it was, but praise the Lord, he's much better. Thank you for that. And and, and to everybody else, just, just hang tough. We're on the back side of this thing, and we're going to be good. And as far as tonight goes, Emmett, it's Friday Night Herf. So share your cigars on the Dojo app. Share what you're drinking. Do some now playing. Let's hear all of that. Until we join you guys next week with Alan Rubin on fr next Friday night, remember, never, never smoke, smoke alone. alone. Hang with us, Bobby. We'll be right back in just a second. Okay. Bye, everybody. Well, hang on.